So I'm really starting to believe that a World War scenario is definitely on the horizon because as the game has progressed, and obviously because the AIs were on Prince difficulty, it was very difficult for them to sustain a, a strong enough army with their economy. But now, a lot of the AIs have gotten enough technologies to the point where they can sustain a, a massive military. And, and we're seeing that, we see that as proof as, as the turns of processing. Pretty much, you can, it, there's like a direct correlation between turn processing and units. For a sieve that has a, a crap load of units, it, it's going to take a lot more a lot more time to process, as well as cities as well. But uh, the big thing is units, just kind of moving and navigating all these units around is, is the big difference. We're starting to see every single turn that goes by take a little bit longer and longer turns to process. And we're starting to see some cargo ships, some, someone like England, trade all the way to the New World. You know she's, getting, she's making bank from those routes. You gotta think that AI is starting to build up these militaries, and because we're moving through later and later into this technology tree, there's some technologies out there that, that's gonna make it very easy for AIs to take cities. And I believe by turn 350, we will see the Shoshone pass William in terms of total population within their empire. That's gonna be a big, big moment, because that'll be the first time William loses that spot uh, with his... With, well, he has three cities, technically. He has two in Europe and one a colony in uh, in Africa. That'll be a huge moment. Um, not that big of a moment. It doesn't really have that much of, a, of an impact, but just for the sake of, of info and statistics and stuff like that, it's he, William will, will drop. He will no longer be number one. Let's, let's check crop yields. Of course, the Shoshone, the Huns, the Zulu, and Mongolia are top four. The Iroquois, who I've been talking about, and I love that storyline, man. The Iroquois, they... They were about to get completely wiped off the planets, and I was so scared of them, and I thought, okay, there's another sieve that's gone. But you know what? That might not actually play out, because the Iroquois were able to distract the Shoshone long enough with their war. The Shoshone were at war with Amer the Americans in Alaska and the Mayan in Central America. And as that happened, the Iroquois built a bigger, bigger military, and they were able to catch up in technology, and they're looking a lot better now. Siam is doing an awesome job as well in the uh, Eastern Asian region. Honestly, they've taken over for Korea uh, because Korea lost their capital and they've been banished to Australia. Uh, they've been doing a, a very good job catching up. Inca are doing well in South America. Actually, I think better than Brazil, surprisingly enough. Um, but Brazil is very close as well. Crop yields says a lot, uh, but it, it says a, multiple, a multitude of things, I guess you could say. Um, Ethiopia doing very well also. GNP... Not really looking too much in that land area. Again, the top four. Then we have the Inca. Sweden, because of that awesome empire they have in the middle of Asia, their eastern Swedish empire, they're doing, they're doing a good job. Let's see. Let's check, uh, let's check military manpower. I want to see where the Iroquois are on this list. They're actually in seventh place behind China, though. So China looks like they're trying to combat against a possible offensive from the Mongolians. That could be possible. But, you know, this region, eastern, eastern Asian... East, the Eastern Asian region is just a, oh man, it's it's a very conflicted region. You've got very strong militaries all close next to each other, all close by each other. The Shoshone are kind of locked off away. The Huns are locked lock, locked off away. The Zulu are far away. They don't really have anyone to, to match, but four through five, all similar in military strength. They're all defending against each other. More than likely, that was Siam and China joining together, not really joining together, but trying to combat against the massive Mongolian military that they were seeing earlier on in the game. I uh, love that the Iroquois are in seventh place. Byzantium in eighth. We've talked about that a lot. Byzantium is strong, but they haven't done anything about it, and it's frustrating. Assyria is strong, too. Ethiopia has enough to maybe... No, that they have half the size of the Zulu army. So maybe not. Um, anything else that I want to see? Social standing, of course... The Netherlands are doing a great job. Germany, Rome, France, pretty much Europe. Europe are, are, are doing best, are, are doing the best job there. Uh, happiness. Let's check if anyone else is losing happiness. Iroquois. The Iroquois are now at zero. Must have been a lot of their expansion and their population growth because of technology. Uh, Shoshone down to three, the Huns. So people have kind of gotten a little bit better at happiness. It's not as bad as it was once before. Uh, technologies. So has anyone catch the Netherlands? Are they still about... Vortex ahead. So yeah, so the, the, the Siam is getting close, but they're not there yet. Uh, Germany, Shoshone, and Inca. And Brazil are starting to catch up. Where did Brazil come from? Brazil kind of came out of nowhere. The Zulu have gone back to 8th place, and the Huns are still around 7th. England looks like they might have dropped a bit here. In terms of city, cities, of course, the Shoshone are still number 1. Five more cities than the second place person, uh, the Huns. Who's generating the most amount? See, the Zulu are generating the most, almost the most amount of science, but 
they've just got a lot of cities. That's the problem. Actually, where are the Shoshone on this list? They're in fourth place. Okay. And finally, let's look at Great Works. Nine. And Tourism. 28 output for, the, for, for William. And uh, 18 for Germany. Let's double check the Cultural Victory screen. Any more civs that have become influential? We've got seven with Germany. Sweden with one. And the Netherlands with five. We're starting to see kind of an impact here. This is interesting. Because, okay, you have to remember that, okay, maybe maybe civs out here in in the Eastern Asian region are, are doing a great job. Maybe they're, maybe they're dominating military. Maybe they're exciting. Maybe it's an exciting storyline. But this is a cultural victory. And unless they're taking a multitude of cities, they're not really taking that much great works for every city that they take, which is a big thing. They, they won't be able to win a cultural victory if they don't start taking a lot of cities. So you know what? Just because, you know, someone like the Shoshone control most of North America, most of North America, uh, just because the Zulu are doing good and get their catching up in technology. At the end of the day, if Europe is the only person and the only, I guess, nations that are getting up uh, enough great works and enough tourism in the world, then they're going to dominate. They're going to win the game. They're not going to dominate. They're, they're going to be weak. They might even fall, like, just be like a mid-sieve, like, sort of game. They might, I, I guess not mid, a mid-sieve sort of level. They might be, like, about, pff, I don't know, 20th rank in, in, with everybody in the entire world. Everyone, they're, they might all be around 20th rank in every single category in terms of the info addicts. But they still might be able to pull out a victory, one of these sieves, which is kind of amazing, actually, you know? It's, it's, it's amazing. You, I just, it doesn't matter. There's a lot of people that think, oh, well, you know, the Zulu are going to win. The Shoshone are going to win because they're the most expansive. But no, it actually might not play out that way. Strangely enough, it actually might not play out that way, which is crazy to think because of the cultural victory, anybody can win. It is still open to any single sieve. I still don't think you can count out anybody, especially, especially not Austria. With their, with their colony of South America. That's the greatest thing I've seen ever. Okay, so uh, World Congress welcomes city-states. What city-states? What are you even talking about? We've already embargoed city-states anyways. Um, so good. The Netherlands actually are going to switch the World Congress. It's going to be... It's because what, what do they grow? What do they get? Two from World Wonders. So wow. It's going to be up between uh, Elizabeth and... Actually, it's already been that way. I don't know why I'm... I don't know what I'm smoking. Okay, cool. So cultural heritage sites. I'm so glad that I don't have to vote anymore. That's excellent. That's so good. Um, because now it's like... I don't... I, you know, I can let the AIs do it. And you know what's funny about this? This is important. That Europe controls the Congress. Europe can pretty much guide the world. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what your name is to call from the rock here. It doesn't matter what, what's going on in Eastern Asia. Because it's, it's Europe that does whatever they want. If Europe doesn't like the, you know, the expansion or whatever it is, they can call for embargoes. And that is terrifying, especially because Europe has a lot of allies here in the middle of Europe. These, these nations might be small, but they hold the same, the same amount of votes. Kind of like to me, it, it reminds me of uh, the, the U.S. Senate. U.S. Senate, there are two senators for California. There are two senators for Wyoming. The two, you know, you know, the two big different city states, I'm sorry, city states, the, the two biggest uh, differences in, in states in, in the U.S. But because, you know, it doesn't matter that these, that Poland isn't very big, that Austria is very big, they're not very big. They still hold the same amount as someone big like Mongolia, someone big like the Zulu. So Europe can control the World Congress, which is important. Man, I just, it's just shocking. Okay, so anyways, um... Genghis Khan is secretly planning against Gandhi. Gandhi has been moving a pretty big amount of forces through uh, territory here. I don't know what they're doing. But yeah, no, it's just it's just an interesting kind of discussion here because I, I just I, I still don't know. I have no idea. It, it, it really is the truth that anybody can win this game. Anybody can win this game. It's it's certainly possible. And the Shoshone actually just passed up William in score. Now that that is a whole different scenario. And again, I haven't discussed that with you guys. And maybe I'll do that with a, maybe a straw poll around turn 400. But, uh, and I've discussed this, I've kind of brought it up earlier, like a lot longer ago. Or I brought it up kind of earlier on in the series. Um, is there anything else happening? No more expansion? Anything else happening with Germany? And uh, Germany seems like it's losing a, a good amount of troops here. Um, what the hell was I talking about? 
what the freak was I talking? Oh, okay. So yes, we talked about this earlier. There might there might be the case. It might be a case where someone's just generating too much culture, where the game could never end. It is possible for that. And unfortunately, I do need to eventually bring this series to an end. Um, I talked about turn 400. I think that might be a little bit too early. We'll see. Um, I think I'll, I'll do a straw poll around turn 400 to kind of get everyone in agreement of when I when they think I can end the game uh, and, and give it to the person with score. Maybe we'll even have a straw poll about that if we should give it to the person with score or with the person that has the most tourism. Um, I guess it will always be up for debates depending on a few things. I mean, would it be the terms of score or the terms? Because it would be like the Shoshone fans will root for score, but, you know, someone like, you know, whoever's rooting for Europe, I guess if we're assuming that Europe is going to be the one with the most cultural influence as of right now, I'm just making a guess, um, then, you know, the people that are rooting for Europe might would might root for, you know, give it to the person that has the most uh, influence with the most amount of sieves. So I don't know. That's going to be complicated. Let's just hope that I, I hope that I don't have to do that. Um, but let's check really quick, actually, and see what we got here. So if we look at the Netherlands and their, you know, kind of uh, progress, they're rising with everybody technically, which is a good sign that we, oh, they're actually not, they're falling with the Iroquois, but the Iroquois don't have that much culture as it is, so they might be able to catch up at, at some point. And they're only, they're, that's it. Okay, so that's fine. That's not too bad. Anybody, so who are the dominant cultural sieves? Germany. So you know what? It might go down to the Netherlands and Germany, and ultimately an, a war could end it. A, a war between these two civs might actually have to break out in order for a cultural victory to end. I mean, to, to, I guess to, for this game to end. And again, that is, of course, assuming that... That's just assuming that things right now stay the same, which they won't. Someone is going to catch up to these two civs. Anyways, so uh, Germany's publicly denounced the Inca, and we have the third Congress. Uh, the Netherlands have gotten the vote, I believe. Has wait, so does it change? Yes, first Congress of Amsterdam. So not only does Amsterdam have a whole bunch of wonders. Wait a second, cultural heritage sites is going to give the Netherlands a whole bunch of culture. I didn't even realize that they've got a crapload of wonders. And you want to embargo the Huns? I'm sure all of your all of Europe is going to uh, definitely say yes to that. Now that is surprising. Yeah, that's going to give William a whole bunch of culture, going to make it harder for someone like Germany to catch up. And, uh, you know, now that we, just really quick, just because we checked uh, William's kind of progress, let's check Germany. So Germany's actually falling with a lot of sieves. But again, they're not, it, it, it doesn't really matter because they're not, wow, they're falling with a lot. Holy crap. Why is that? They're very unpopular. They're very unpopular. Oh, this is going to be tough. But they're right there next to the William, so I don't know. Can't be that hard. Hmm. Wow, I'm glad that we checked that out. That that reveals a lot of information. Genghis Khan pl 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 uh, plotting against Persia. Again, there's a co coalition war against Carthage, but, you know, Rome decided has not decided to join in against that. Uh, they still don't have enough musketeers, I think, to be able to do anything. I'm sorry, musket men. I always... I'm having this Rome campaign, and I talk about musketeers a lot, and I was talking about musketeers a lot, so I... Ah... <sighs> I always mistake these musket men for musketeers. Lots of Spanish missionaries continuing to spread Catholicism. How's the war going on between Denmark and Germany? I do see a lack of uh, military from both sides here. We need to check on that after the break, after the, the, uh, the this turn processes. We need to check on exactly where Denmark and Bismarck is in terms of military. Babylon's denounced both France and Egypt. Poland's getting up some cannon units and stuff like that. Ooh, we have some sea beggars. We have some sea beggars from William. We've got our first sea beggar. And uh, I don't think that England had any iron, so I think that would explain why they wouldn't be able to get up any, any ship of the lines, although they could trade for that. And it seems like Elizabeth is extremely buddy-buddy with all of the natives in the New World. So we have Carthage and Siam piecing out. Ooh, we see a loss of health here in Seattle, but they're doing good. They're doing good. Again, we see no differences between... We still see a break in the uh, the American Empire. The American Empire is such a weird phrase to say. Uh, between Atlanta and Seattle following different, different religions. That is what uh, America is most significant for, I guess, in this region. I guess in this game, I mean. And that is about it. Again, there are lots of wars that are going on, but nothing super impactful. 
And you're seeing a lot of these AIs with their economies being able to generate more and more units, which is scary for some of these civs who still have not got the picture, like Indonesia. Indonesia has not gotten the picture just yet. Poland is now over here in Australia. Do I see any settlers coming that this way? I don't. I see a lot of Zulu troops, though. A lot of Zulu ships. But that's it. A lot of people are just kind of discovering the seas right now. Uh, looks like Songhai was given enough time to some... Well, actually, no. Their city here, I believe it's Janine is how you pronounce that. I'm not sure. Jean? Janine? Um, <laughs> uh, they don't have any units protecting their city here. Now, the, Sung, the, the Asking Empire, the Songhai Empire, can protect their main two cities, but they will not be able to protect here, which is only going to give the Zulu more power. Although, it, 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 it's going to break them more, too. The Prince AI is having some very major difficulty staying extremely expansive, which I like because it doesn't let someone get too powerful, which is the biggest difference between this campaign and the previous one. They're not letting a lot of the civs get too powerful, like the Shoshone. The Shoshone have 16 cities, but they can't possibly expand anymore because they're having uh, economic limitations, they're having happiness limitations, they're having all these limitations, as well as they have a foe. In the, in the northeast, in the Canadian region. Okay, the Iroquois Canadian Empire. <laughs> so you can't really attack the Iroquois. You know, I got to give it to America here being in a defensive spot. They're in a pretty defensive spot and they're building units for themselves. So good for them. Yeah, good for them, I guess. Wait, I'm surprised how just quiet Brazil has been, though. That has been probably the most shocking is to see in just Brazil absolutely quiet. Okay, so l l I did want to check on this. Um, let's double check and see exactly where military, what, what military standing Germany and Denmark are. So we're, we got Germany in 20th spot at 69,000 troops. And where's Denmark? Denmark at 25th, 25th spot at 58,000. So that would mean that someone like France is ahead. Surprisingly enough, uh, surprise, surprisingly enough, with France only having two cities, one in Europe, one in the northernmost part of Scandinavia, has more units. Rome, of course, has more units. Sweden has more units. This is what I'm saying. Of course, William does. Byzantium does, but they don't really have a super big impact on the game. Hmm. And they're, and they're still at war. They're still very much evenly matched, so I don't think there's going to be a peace deal anytime soon. So... What, what, what are these, uh, so I, now I'm starting to see William build. This is the second sea beggar, sea beggar he's gotten up. The second sea beggar. I, I don't know why else he'd be building that unless he'd be going to war. Surprise about the France, the, fr the French military. Very surprised about that. Uh, Denmark pikeman is going out for a suicide mission. Actually, maybe he's not. A lot of the troops from Germany, well, they're either out here locked off in sea, which isn't very smart, um, or they're protecting Munich, but not too many are protecting Berlin. It doesn't look like there's no way, I don't think, because because Harold Bluetooth can't get up enough units, I think, to, to make a landing here in Germany. These, these units are probably going to lose. Oh, man, this is going to be bad. This is going to be so bad for Harold and Bismarck. They're going to lose a lot of units because there's no way they take over Berlin, Berlin with two pikemen. Especially with the, the Hamburg and Berlin being so close to each other. Two city bombardments uh, a turn at least. As well as you've got a cannon unit stationed inside of Hamburg. The Oh man, you're going to lose so much. You're going to lose so much. Who knows what else they send over. More than likely they're going to send over the trebuchet. The Zulu have peaced out with Carthage. More than likely this is, this is going to free up Shaka's eyes. I guess that's a weird phrase. But it is going to free Shaka up to declare war on somebody else. Someone like Spain. Someone like... Songhai, I think. I know that he, Shaka wants to go to war with uh, with Songhai, but he can't. He can't do it right now. I don't think his empire can afford it. It's interesting just to see these limitations. I love it that the AI is actually facing human, you know, real realistic limitations, Econ whether it be economic happiness, you know, whatever it is. It might not be those two specifically, but they're seeing limitations because on the deity AI, they don't have any limitations at all. That's why they just continue to go to war. So whatever it may be, whether they don't think they have a strong enough military, whatever it is, they're seeing limitations that they don't normally see on deity. So that's what's kind of cool about this. Um, and it doesn't, it, ref it kind of limits 
the sieves, and it keeps Europe somewhat, you know, in power. Somewhat in power. Somewhat in power. Even though they're not. They're, they've been caught slightly. Alright, guys. Looks like I'm actually going to have to stop it right there. Let's see what kind of spy information we can see. Uh, Genghis Khan is secretly plotting against Sweden. Hmm. Interesting. But alright, guys. I'm going to have to stop right there. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you guys next time.